Right, so tonight I'm going to look at uh, gender equality and whether or not it really is a key factor in trying to tackle climate change. Now, many people think that's the case, um, and so what I'm going to do in this lecture is to really look at does that make sense? Is there reality? Is there evidence that can tell us that achieving gender equality and empowering all women, as it says in goal number five, is really going to help us tackle climate change? So let's just think a little bit about what does that mean? So when we go around the world and we see all the different places that are impacted by climate change, of course what we see are that the world's poorest are the ones who are the most affected. Um, whether, it, whether or not it's to do with water shortages, flooding and so forth. But when you're down on the ground, what you see is that women are actually differentially affected than compared to men, and in a, in a worse sense. And what's worrying is that the trend is even more pronounced the larger the disaster. So women and children particularly face vulnerabilities, but these come not only from the environment, but also from cultural norms and their lower socioeconomic status. And this kind of puts them at odds with what is going on around them. In principle, they also become, because of their disproportionate use of natural resources, water, firewood, forest products, they become particularly vulnerable in those areas that are suffering from the extremes of climate change. And as those resources become scarcer, women ex experience an increased burden. I mean, I've seen for myself that women have to work, walk further and further to get water. They have to walk further and further to find firewood. And so as a result, just even that time dimension, the use of the extra time and the energy may actually tip some of them into poverty. So as we see further population growth, it puts those at the periphery even more at risk. But, and this is I think the, the part of the talk I want to come to at the end is about solutions, is that despite the vulnerabilities, our experience of women and girls around the world is that they are very, very likely to be contributing the solutions. But the challenge is that many of them don't have their voices heard. It means that that whole extensive knowledge that they have about the environment and about resources is completely untapped. So let's step back a little bit. When we think about the sustainable goals, and we think about particularly goal um, 13, but also 11 and 14, about how we use resources, the agreements under the Paris, um, the Paris Agreement, it's very much about the change. But what it implies is that we are not helpless victims. We can use different methods, we can use different strategies, we can adapt to climate change all around the world, and it's, and it's certainly encouraged under some of the other goals, goal four, for example, that empowering women through education, particularly children, is an important policy that helps in that. It helps to strengthen the whole way in which people respond to climate change. But today, when we look at those strategies, we can often see that they simply reflect the social norms, and those concern what is acceptable to men rather than women. So we see that women are becoming more empowered, they're becoming more educated, they have control over their lives, and they dedicate a lot of resources to health and education compared to men. But gender, let's ask the question, does it influence the way that environmental issues are solved? Yes. And in particular, climate change. So when you're next reading the newspapers or you're thinking about who's on the street, who's at the front door, who's carrying the banners, and you do a quick head count, so this is very unscientific, but just look through the crowds of people. And what we can tell, even now, is that those forces, so to speak, those common voices on the road, are the ones that are coming from women, from children, and not so much from men. So that would be one piece of research I would love to do, which is go and analyse the density of people who are in those marches. But it is very clear that some of the iconic leaders in that debate are coming from youth and actually coming from, from women's groups. So what I'm going to talk about today is sort of two ideas. One is the specification, the specificity of gender, specifically relating to climate change. And then, in a sense, the stratification of the discrimination that we see, because it's not all in one block. It really turns out to be much more subtle than that. So thinking about 
all of the climate change issues. Many people will think of climate change in terms of disasters. That's, that's what's sort of foremost in people's minds. And they'll think about other things like erosion and maybe toxic issues and heat waves and floods and so forth. But storms, and I'm sure that any of you sitting in this room who've been here in the last few weeks will be thinking about storms, so keep Dennis in your mind, um, is really part of the whole climate change story. But here's the bad news. Female storms or female named storms are bad for your health. I don't know if you know that, but it turns out that we have a naming tradition. So a little while ago, about five, six years ago, two colleagues, Jung and, and colleagues, put together a paper. And what they did was they identified what is essentially a worrying phenomenon. They said that the gendered naming of natural disasters was tapping into gender stereotypes. Now imagine that. It's got really serious, potentially dangerous consequences. So what they did was they looked through all the archive data, they looked at lots of experiments, they took people in and they asked them three things. It was about subjective predictions of hurricane intensity, delays to evacuation decisions, and intentions to follow an evacuation order. Now what was incredible was they found that if the storms were named after a female, people didn't think it was as bad, didn't decide to evacuate, and didn't follow orders. Okay, now the reactions from the academic world were really rapid and they questioned the methodology, but I went back and looked at it, and in fact, it's pretty close. You know, it, it's okay, it's not maybe statistically absolutely to the final decimal place, but the indication is that we have stereotyping deeply embedded in us. So I, I cast out to you, we've just had Dennis. Now, I have to say that's a slightly bizarre name, but anyway, Dennis it is. And so I'm hoping that all of you felt motivated to do whatever you had to do, depending on where you were, because it was called Dennis, right? Now, in the UK, we had the Name Our Storms campaign. And what it did was it actually led to the introduction of names in 2015. And we got together with the, with the Irish and with the Dutch, and so they decided to do the same thing. One storm male, one storm female, and then the only thing they did was to omit the, letter, the names with the letters Q, U, X, Y, and Z. So those were kind of taken out. So what we ended up was, just so you know, for 2019 and 20, Atia, Brendan, Chiara, Dennis, Ellen, Francis, Gerda, Iris, Jan, Kitty, Liam, Maura, Noah, Olivia, Piet, Rosin, Samir, Tara, Vince and Willow. Right, so I hope you're all going to pay attention now because if Willow happens to be a hurricane or a storm force six or seven, you should definitely pay attention as opposed to if it was Vince that sounds very strong and is going to do something, you see. So anyway, when they receive these names, it's, these are all the ones with the high impact for rain and wind and snow, amber or you know, red weather warnings, then so they're not, they're not trivial. None of them are trivial storms. But if there was one simple fix to reducing some of the fatalities, it would be to introduce gendered or ungendered, non-gendered names for storms. But it would be an interesting experiment for you to follow that the next time a storm comes along, or even just think about Dennis, and think about all the subsequent storms, just what your first reaction is, and then listen to what it is that the storm warning actually comes through. Okay, so just do that as a small experiment. I think it'd be quite interesting for you. Anyway, um, so naming of storms just tells you that there's some deep-rooted sense about gender stereotyping. So now, though, let's just go back to what climate often is portrayed as, and, and in genuine terms, is, is realistically what we're dealing with, and that is natural disasters. So I'm going to take two examples, um, because some of them are much more extreme, but I, I want to show you what the gender effects are. And the first one is that if you go and talk to rescue workers in the disaster field, they will always tell you that after a major storm or a natural disaster, there is a disproportionate impact on women and children regardless. And that is an extraordinarily worrying uh, phenomenon. So LSE, the London School of Economics, University of Essex, they were the ones that documented that the worse the natural disaster, the bigger the gender disparity. 
Now, the massive earthquake that we saw in Nepal in 2015 was no exception. What we saw there, though, was something quite, quite unique. So it hit at 7.8 magnitude. It was an enormous earthquake. And then there was a violent aftershock. And essentially, it hit Kathmandu and leveled the city. It even shifted Mount Everest by one inch. <coughs> that is how powerful it was. So it killed 9,000 people, it injured 22,000, and it affected essentially a quarter of the country's population. So it was a, it was a huge thing. Nearly 800,000 buildings were destroyed or damaged, and there were thousands of people then living outside. They had no access or very limited access to water and electricity. And the earthquake destroyed everything, the homes, offices, infrastructure. But it also destroyed a lot of social, economic and political processes. And the total cost was close to $7 billion. Now, on counting, and there's a question here, after the event, because there were landslides, there were many things that followed, it was clear that more women than girls had died compared to men and boys. And so what happened was a lot of analysis as to how the population coped really then began to click in. So the first thing was that the women who survived were really hard hit. And it was clear that because of the kinds of changes that had been going on in, in the Nepali society, where many, many men had gone away to work elsewhere and were sending remittances back, that the, basically the prime people on the ground were women. Now, of course, they didn't he hesitate to respond. I mean, they started literally clearing the rubble. Women's organizations leapt into action. There were volunteers. People were helping survivors. They were distributing food and medicine and clothing and putting monetary support into different organizations. They were helping to deliver maternity and baby kits. Um, they provided special care for pregnant women, lactating women, adolescent girls. They offered psychosociological support. They created safe space for women and girls. And what they did was they gathered and collected people together. They connected survivors to find out you know, how they could use legal services, humanitarian services, and everything. And they built very quickly. And they built these networks. And in a sense, they reached out to the international community themselves. And then international actors came in and worked with them. What was fascinating was that not only were they taking care of their families and their neighbors, but they also took over all of the male responsibilities. So they essentially started rebuilding the houses in the towns and villages. They built the infrastructure. They put food together, shelter, clothing, medicines, and so forth. So with a lot of the population overseas, more than 7% of Nepali men, um, some of the women had already become household, the heads of their households, and so they had already assumed some kind of sole responsibility. But the challenge was that many, many people had lost their, uh, many women had lost their ID cards. So they had literally no way to establish their right to have access to humanitarian relief, to regain access to their homes. Um, in different places across the rural and, and also urban areas, pregnant women particularly, women of certain castes, widows, these were all individuals and groups who were particularly affected by the earthquake because they essentially lost overnight all their rights to anything. So not only did they face the pre-existing constraints, no money and a lot of you know, challenges, but then on top of that, they couldn't regain their livelihoods. Because it, the other thing was that the Nepali women essentially were running agriculture. And overnight, they lost their assets. They couldn't essentially harvest. They couldn't bring things to market. So they faced severe income loss. They faced loss of food stocks, livestock, crop productivity, and so on. But the most amazing thing was that the government had kind of anticipated a long-term plan. They calculated what it would take. And then they were literally sort of taken by surprise when the women, despite being burdened with enormous amounts of domestic work and, in a sense, rebuilding the city, their response and the recovery of basic services took about half of the time that they had anticipated because of the way that people were working. They worked together. And, and so this is a kind of classic case where 
the extreme event shows you just what is possible. Now, Nepal is obviously an extreme case of gender specificity of loss because these ladies really did lose everything. But it's very clear from work that's been done by quite a few research centres that all major disasters show that women suffer disproportionately in comparison to most men when disaster strikes. And it has to do with access to resources, mobility, and so forth. So those of you who remember the Kobe earthquake, one and a half times as many women died compared to men in Kobe. And, and the Asian tsunami in 2004, three times as many women died as men. And those individual, individuals who are reported as having died uh, because of Hurricane Katrina many of them still remain missing. I mean, so there's, a, there's still an enormous number of people, and I'll come to that, about the invisibility of women in the data that, that we hold. So there's an enormous number of fatalities. We see that they're proportionately more women, um, even though gender and race and age and everything else are known. So to learn a lot more about what happens to women, particularly those who are low income, the Institute for Women's Policy Research did a lot of research following Katrina. So they worked in Louisiana, they worked in Mississippi and Texas. And what they found was that women are always at greater risk during disasters. And it's for a variety of reasons. So, for example, in New Orleans, more women than men live in poverty. And at the time that Hurricane Katrina hit, nearly 26% of women in New Orleans were living below the poverty line compared to less than 20% of men. So already you've stacked the cards against women. And why does poverty matter? Well, it matters because it, at the moment that you need resources, they're just not available. So if you need resources to escape, to survive, when escape is impossible, you just don't have those. So women who were interviewed in New Orleans um, basically said that if they were in public housing, very, very few of them had cars. And normally what would happen is they would essentially walk out of their house and they would walk to wherever they had to go or they'd get a bus. But of course, all of that had gone when the city was flooded by the levees. So the women who could escape their homes, they basically were stranded. And they were stranded all around the city. And unless they could find somebody with an undamaged vehicle or a boat who could help, that was it, and there they stayed. And many women and children died in those circumstances. Other factors were also present. So quite often women would have children, or they would basically be at home having had a baby. They would be in residences which are less stable. So the construction um, not quite up to having a massive <coughs> disaster or flood or storm surge. And you have women who are recovering from pregnancy, from childbirth, people who are elderly. For example, in New Orleans, a very, very high number of people of the elderly, percentage of the elderly, are women. So effectively, these individuals were not evacuated. They were just left and essentially unable to survive. The sad thing also is that after a disaster like Katrina, um, horrifying as that possibly was at the time, is that women all over the world, when there's been a climate disaster, they face gender-based violence. Physical, mental, emotional violence, um, you name it, it happens, particularly at times of disaster and in the immediate response and in the years to follow. So, for example, in Nepal, lots of people were displaced and they were put into very large groups in tents and temporary shelters, um, and that really led to a lot of security and privacy issues, particularly for women and girls. In the case of Hurricane Katrina, the rate of gender-based violence, and that includes sexual assault, domestic violence in Mississippi, went from 4.6 per 100,000 people per day. When the hurricane hit, it went up to 16.3 per 100,000 per day. So, and it remained like that for quite some time. So these are women who are displaced from their homes. They're in temporary shelters and trailers. Now, the rate did decline in subsequent years, but it took quite a long time to go down. And as a result of that, a lot of different situations and conditions meant that women effectively were far, far more affected by the disaster, by the climate disaster um, and, and the storm. And yet, 
women are the ones who've continued the effort to rebuild homes, to relocate themselves or to go back to where they were and really to start to create the possibility of a future that is potentially more sustainable. And what's fascinating is that as women have gone back into these communities and the ones that have been studied in the long term, for example in Nepal, but also here in, in uh, Florida, is that they, in Mississippi, they have assumed new roles. And in taking those new roles into the community, they're talking about preparing for future crises. So in Nepal, for example, women are being trained as masons to build homes that are earthquake proof. Um, and the training programs are basically there and many, many uh, courses are now entirely training women. And they're also looking at how to mitigate the effects of future disasters, for example, landslides and floods, by looking at not only earthquake proofing, but also resituating where new homes are being built. So when we think about now the sort of specificity of gender, and, and I, I mean that in the sense that it's not just simply male and female, but it's the, the roles that people are cast in, it's, it's quite interesting because here you see the kind of the, the victims or the people who are at the bottom end of the chain. And these are some of the ladies who are suffering from the drought in Turkana, north of where I live in, in Kenya. Um, and yet they're full of hope. I think I mentioned in a previous lecture, there was a lady lying in her house, um, actually very close to this family on the left, with a cow next door, starving. And, and people would say, well, why did you keep the cow alive? And they said, because when the drought is over, I'll need a cow. So it's a sense of there's always future hope. But there's a mask over all of these individuals. And it's really about the invisibility. So quite honestly, the losses of women resulting from the localization of climate change and the disasters are invisible or simply not measured. Now, there's a the great book by a lady called Criado Perez. I don't know if any of you have read that. It's called Invisible Women. And what she does is she brings together lots and lots of case studies um, stories, research from all over the world. And what it talks about is the way that women are forgotten, literally on a daily basis, whether it's government uh, policies, medical research to technology, media, workplaces. Essentially, there's a whole missing piece of gender-specific data. And, and what it's actually done unwittingly is we've created a world that is, what I would say, um, it's basically biased against women. I don't mean that in a wholly pejorative way, because it's actually physical. It's the way that the world is designed. It's actually designed for men. So the shape and the size of mobile phones is often designed for the size of the hand of a man. I happen to have a very large hand, so I'm very lucky. But effectively, that matters, because when you're putting together lists of missing persons, and what you have is a mobile phone. There's all kinds of connectivity here. But even in compiling the list of missing persons, the way in which that has been done in the past is, well, if you don't have an ID card, then you can't be missing. Hmm, OK, fine. So this is a huge issue for us. If you don't exist, but there you are physically standing in front of the person, but I can't record you because you don't have a number, how am I going to record you? I could take your photograph, but no, what does that mean? Oh, just move aside, please. Next person, and there you get the person with the ID card. So effectively, what we see now that we stand poised with all the sustainable development goals, asking for gender disaggregated data are huge gaps in our capacity to talk about the differences between men and women. The way that data are compiled just simply don't exist, let alone spatially saying, well, here is a place where there are a lot of women and children. Here is a place where there are fewer or there are more balanced um, gender ratios. So this is one of the reasons why the UN so persistently pushed to have disaggregated data by, by sex and also by age. There's also the fact that climate change, because it's having this greater effect on those who are more reliant, on resources for their livelihoods and yet have the least capacity to respond 
this is the this is the other reason you want to know where your vulnerabilities are, where the hotspots are, and essentially it means that you know whether it's raising the name of storms as a quick win, or whether it means actually going and doing surveys and seeing how many people there are in a place and how many of the poorest are actually women. This is all part of the way of fighting climate change. So it might sound like a long way away from putting sandbags on your door. But the beauty of, I guess, living in a place like the UK is that, in a sense, you, you are all counted. We are all counted. But in very, very many parts of the world, people are not counted. And particularly women are not counted. Now, if we would like to have gender equality, then one of the things that it brings along and the motivation to have gender equality is to bring women as critical agents of change with that potential to strengthen climate resilience into the conversation. So women can play an enormously important role, not only in their local knowledge and how resources are changing, but also how to weather the destruction of biodiversity and ecosystems that's going on all around them. The challenge, of course, is that they have unequal participation in many of the decision-making practices. And all that does is it simply compounds inequalities. And in effect, it prevents women from fully participating and contributing to the debate. So women's participation is not only about having another voice in the room. Clearly, some of these ladies would like to have had their voice heard long before they were exposed to the conditions which led them to these extremes of malnutrition. But, their, but women's participation in the political debates is often being much more responsive to citizens' needs more generally. So it's about understanding cooperation, understanding how ethnic lines and delivering sustainable peace. These are all important things. So having women included at political levels to tackle climate change brings an entirely different level of texture to the kinds of policies and actions that we see. And that is why in the Paris Agreement, there's a very, very specific provision that involves women. And if you read the Paris Agreement, it talks very much about equality, but where there isn't equality, it exercises whatever power it has to urge governments to ensure that there is equality and that women and men's voices are equally heard both in the development of national policies, but also by saying that they have to be gender responsive. So it's, it's certainly worth looking at the Paris Agreement through the lens of gender and seeing why governments are being pushed so hard on this. And that's the, gen that's the general issue, is Paris and the Paris Agreement under Sustainable Development Goal um, 13 is, of course, all about climate change, but it faces a formidable set of enemies around discrimination, its stratification by gender, by religion, by sexual orientation, by race and by age. So there's a whole underbelly that sits there that if you don't tackle it effectively, we will not be able to head off some of the things that we need to do to face <coughs> climate change. Now, one of the ways that we can face, I guess, and protect themselves from the extremes of climate change is to look at the way that we manage our land. And essentially, we know, and I've talked about this in previous lectures, we just simply know that by taking care of forests, by taking care of the oceans, by removing plastics, for example, from the oceans, all of these have an enormous effect on the way in which the natural world can respond and help to mitigate a lot of climate change. Just to give you a small um, kind of small anecdote, last week I spent um, with people from all over the world as sort of the experts in plastics and marine plastics. And we were looking at the evidence of the damage that plastics are bringing into the natural world and particularly in the marine environment. And it's quite extraordinary that when you see not only the damage that plastics face, plastics form within the ecological setting, but on an individual species. So imagine a lugworm, it's sitting in the benthos and instead of eating food, it's consumed a lot of microplastics. Um, it's consumed some microfibers. And so now, because it can't digest it, it's essentially sitting with a stomach full of inert material. So, of course, it's got no energy. So it can't actually start to turn the soil over, uh, the, 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 the sediments over. So effectively, you've got a lazy lugworm not doing what it's supposed to do. 
And this is really important, actually, for climate change because we need all of our ecosystems working literally at full tilt to make sure that carbon is sequestered, that the oceans remain um, at about the pH that they have, and so forth. So when we're talking about thinking of gender and so on and so forth, it really matters how everybody participates in society, everybody, because we can't tackle climate change just from high-minded conversations, say, in New York. We actually have to get right down to the fact that we're using a lot of fossil fuels with emissions in our household items, in our particular personal care, and so forth. And I think what's missing sometimes is that connectivity between the natural world and actually what we do in our everyday business. So coming back to gender, one of the ways that people can protect themselves from the extremes of climate change, and more broadly, um, how can we you know, avoid, avoid catastrophic losses, is to really think about our impact on life and on natural resources. Now, if we go out into particularly the developing world, we see that that management of land, of forests, is really very much in the hands of women. However, women are widely discriminated against in terms of land tenure. Um, if you look at some of the figures, they're, they're, they're kind of shocking. Uh, if you look at, for example, agricultural landholders in Saudi Arabia, it's 0.8%. So it's less than 1%. Um, as opposed to in Cap Verde, where it's 51%. Uh, globally, it's 12.8%. So it's a tiny amount of land is actually owned by women. And yet, nearly 60% of the workforce in most countries in the developing world are women on agricultural land. In addition, we have nearly 100 countries where there are customary, traditional, religious practices that actually discriminate against women, in particular about owning land. So when we think about who's working the land and who is owning the land, there's a huge disparity. And then when we think about who receives the benefits of agricultural products, it's about 20%. So women have uh, about, only 21% only about of women earn and receive payments from their work on the land. So if we expect women, particularly who dominate the land workforce, to take care of the land so that we can tackle climate change, then we need to look again at gender equality. So when we see climate breakdown and we see the kind of crisis of environmental degradation, it would appear that it's not totally appropriate to sort of put that at the feet of the people who are actually managing the land because they have very little levers of power. And in fact, what is horrifying is that the degradation of the environment by many big parties is actually leading to increasing violence against women and girls. So that essentially that gender-based exploitation is hampering any ability to tackle the crisis. So when we look at the attempts to repair environmental degradation, to try and help the planet in a way respond to climate change and to prevent climate breakdown, particularly in poorer countries, we see that there's no account of gender inequality and the effects of women and children are literally not taken into account. So what we say and what we see is now that campaigners are calling on governments, institutions, to take note and say that impacts on women and girls have to be at the heart of any viable strategy on dealing with the climate and the ecological underpinning that will help the planet respond. So there's a really interesting study by IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and they're based in Geneva. And what they did was they took a couple of years and they looked at a thousand sources of research, which is a lot, about gender-based violence in connection with climate and environmental degradation. I'll read you what, they, what the conclusion says. It says, we found gender-based violence to be pervasive and there is enough clear evidence to suggest that climate change is increasing gender-based violence. As environmental degradation and stress on ecosystems increases, that in turn creates, creates scarcity and stress for people, and the evidence shows that where environmental pressures increase, gender-based violence also increases. That's a pretty, pretty sobering result. Um, 
And that environmental stress linked to climate change means that as we see more women on the front line, they really are seeing the worst side of this. So 60% of respondents to this report said that they had actually seen it themselves. They had observed gender-based violence, particularly amongst female environmental rights defenders, environmental migrants and refugees, and particularly where there was environmental crime and environmental degradation taking place. And they've got 80 case studies that actually demonstrate this. Now, it could be said then that gender-based violence rather than spewing out lots of fossil fuel, is one of the most pervasive, but it's the least talked about barrier to, to actually tackling climate change. Um, what they found is that wherever there's environmental degradation, and I'm sure those of you who are in that uh, field of interest, you would, would know this, that there's trafficking, there's human trafficking, there's all kinds of problems to deal with wildlife poaching and illegal sources and resource extraction. Um, and we know for a fact that that's prevalent in many places, the, the, um, the DRC, for example, that's where it's linked. But there's lots and lots of examples where environmental defenders and climate activists who try to stop the destruction, let's say, of the forests of the land, are then uh, suppressed by sexual violence, and essentially their status within the community is also undermined, and people are discouraged from coming forward. So what global climate change is doing and tackling it is putting a lot of pressure not only on resources like extreme weather and heat waves and droughts and floods but it's also putting a lot of pressure on communities who want to speak out and women almost uh, across the world are those even though they are disadvantaged and they don't have access to land and so forth these are the ones who are often standing up but they are the first to be targeted and one small glimmer of what that looks like is that in quite a lot of communities, for example in the Amazon but also in Africa, young girls are being married off as early as possible when the family sees what's happening with climate change. So we think that in the last um, two or three years, 12 million more young girls have been married off because of the increase of natural disasters, weather-related disasters, and loss of resources because of that. Um, and sexual trafficking has gone up by 20 to 30 percent. So these are kind of like the hidden layers behind tackling climate change. And there's also a daily business, because women are often burdened with having to go and collect water. You see this lady, she's having to go a long, long way to go and collect water, to find firewood. And as these become more scarce, then under the ecological impacts of climate change, then, of course, they're exposed to further dangers of violence. So the whole thing is kind of stacking up. And then what you see, of course, is that all of that time taken going to get resources means that women are not spending time having that civic discourse, trying to mobilise, trying to create change <coughs> on the ground. So when we look at countries around the world, there's at least more, well, there's more than 60 or 70 countries where you have no access on the whole to water on premises or where it's like 70 or 80 percent, then it's estimated that there's millions of working days per year spent fetching and carrying water. In India, it's 150 million days spent going to get water and bringing it back. 40 billion working hours are lost in water collection each year in sub-Saharan Africa. And in Africa, in rural Africa, it's now estimated that it takes more than half an hour to get to water. So everything is getting more and more and more and more stretched. So what are the solutions? Well, we've got some wonderful people who are leading these discussions. You can see Mary Robinson, Bono, he has to be there, of course, yes. The lady behind, she's the minister from, um, from Brazil. Many, many others. And what they're trying to do is to highlight women who can lead the fight against climate change, bringing equality back onto the table, and really trying to build a, a global movement that's going to create a feminist solution from climate change. Now, this is not to say that men and women are a part in this. But it's if you deny 50% of the population, or whatever that percentage is in your particular setting, the voice to express. And when that voice is very, very close to the ground and understands the kind of signals that are going on, then actually you're doing a disservice to the whole of society because you're not really getting the best evidence to make the policies work. <coughs> 
So the Mothers of Invention is what this is called. Um, it's supposed to be light-hearted. There's lots of things like podcasts. There's grassroots people. And it's an antidote, in a sense, to say, well, if you include all of us, then actually we can create solutions together. So many, many people from all over the world um, are trying very hard to bring this message to say, right now, climate change is not gender neutral. It affects women far more. So it's not just about climate. It's about climate justice. It's about giving people the positive message that everybody can participate um, in a sense, on trying to make that solution something for all of us to work on. Women have very important capacities for transformation, but they have specific vulnerabilities that are exacerbated. And it's this combination that needs to be brought together. So, interestingly, countries are kind of responding to this. The Dominican Republic um, is amongst the ten, ten nations which are most affected by climate change. Um, and in terms of gender equality, it's the fourth most unequal country in Latin America and Caribbean. And it's recognized this, that it's actually got to do something. So their plan is fascinating because instead of doing the normal, what we might call the male pathway, they've decided that they're going to do a completely different thing. They're going to turn it on its head and it's already begun. So what they will have is a gender-based approach to disaster management. Top of the list, is security and sexual security of women who are the most threatened in the disaster situations. Um, they're going to focus on diseases such as dengue and Zika and chikungunya, which of course affect women when they're pregnant. They have a gender and climate change approach to the water law, specifically looking at how far women have to travel or to walk to get water. Um, they're trying to bring in then permanent watershed reforestation plans where the women are actually made the frontline foresters. Um, same thing in fisheries. The list goes on and on and on. And it's fascinating because they've basically mobilized 50% of the population. And it's beginning to really have an effect. So once you turn the lens around and say, we actually want the whole population, we want gender equality in our climate policies, then you get quite a remarkable shift in the way that people respond to climate change. It tends to be more uh, a message of hope, a more optimistic view. Yes, we can do things. Yes, we can change. The real challenge at the bottom of the line, though, is that we need much, much more information. We need data that is stratified and disaggregated and really allows us to see just the different roles and ways in which people are performing. I, lo I just love this picture. I always put it up. This is actually real. This is not photoshopped. <laughs> it's, from a, it's from one of the valleys in, in China. If you ever get to go there, it's one of the geological wonders of the world. It's, it's for real. So, uh, yeah, if you ever get a chance to go there. But that stratification is what we're after now. There's no point in just using statistics that say 20% of the population are at risk. Well, no, if not if that 20% of the population are all the women in a particular area, all the children, all the vulnerable people. So going back to Criado Perez, um, who I think is a wonderful advocate for trying to not queer the pitch by saying, OK, it's all got to be about women, but it's saying... No, this whole group, this whole part of our population just is not represented because the data and the information are not there. So if we think about the Sustainable Development Goals, it's imperative that we try to think across the board about how many women, how many children, how many vulnerable people there are in every single policy that we put on the table. Bad data actually leads to bad resource decisions. And she makes, and others have made, the case that really objective data can be highly male biased um, and that public spending, whether it's on health or education, the workplace, society, are going to be worse off as a result. So I think that climate change is absolutely no exception. If we want to build climate resilience, we need to bring the invisible half of the population, i.e. the women, into decision making, into thinking, and planning. So I would say policymakers take heed. Thank you very much.